Hello, um, welcome to my talk. I am Anin Gohari, and uh, in this presentation, I will talk about measuring and communicating information. This is the outline of my talk. First, I will talk about information itself. What is information and what does it mean to measure information? Then I will discuss a particular approach uh, for measuring information, that is Shannon's approach. And uh, in the last part, I will talk about communicating information. So let us begin with the first part. What is information? Um, it is hard to formally define information, but we can give examples of information. So when we think of information, we might think of books, or we might think of hard drives or memory sticks. These are all examples of information sources. So an image can have information. So you might have visual information, a video, for instance. Um, information can be in the form of a speech in terms of music, voice. Um, it can be also in terms of the smell of a flower. It also, that also contains information. Information exists in biological systems. For instance, brain uh, is an information processing um, object, right? We can also think of information in the context of mathematical structures like sets. So if I give you a bunch of numbers, I'm giving you some information. Or in terms of graphs, if I give you a graph, uh, I'm giving you some information. So what do you mean by, what do we mean by measuring information? Um, so it's easy to think of measuring weight or measuring the length. So if I want to measure my weight, I can go on a scale, right? And uh, measure my weight. Or I can use a ruler to measure length, a length, length of an object, right? So what is measuring information? It's basically you're given an a source of information like a voice, a video, a talk, an image or something like that. And you want to assign a real number that represents the information content of that information source. So for instance, um, you have an image and you want to say that, oh, this in, the information content in this image is two point zero one or something like that. Um, so if you assign um, uh, if you assign a number to the information content and if you measure information, it allows you to compare um, different forms of information, right? So when you are measuring weight, we can see which object is heavier, right? Um, if we uh, measure the information content, we can say, oh, this image is more informative than that music, for instance. So it allows us to compare different forms of information. So for instance, consider a two-page news article versus an image. Is it true that an image is really worth a thousand words? Right, so um, as an example, consider these two images of the sun. Uh, which one has more information? Is it reasonable to measure information of these two pictures, right? Um, so how about this picture? It's a third picture of the sun. I mean, which one has more information? So you might think that 
it's not it's not a reasonable question to ask, right? Um, on the other hand, um, so you can note that each of these three images of the sun are stored in my computer, right? And they take up a size. Um, the files have some size, so I might want to measure their information content by the size of the file on my computer, right? That's one way to measure information, but what do we mean by uh, measuring information? So how shall we measure information then? Suppose you ask a question and get an answer. How do you tell if the answer involves a large amount of information, a small amount of information, or no information at all? So here are some ideas. So the first idea could be, let's look at the length of the answer. However, we know that an answer can be long, but not relevant or informative. So a person can talk a lot, but not necessarily communicating much. Another idea is to look at the juice of what is being said, the essence of what is being said, or a good, the length of a good summary of what is being said. But that's hard to quantify, right? It's hard to measure. It's hard to define what we mean by that. A third idea is to look at the value or the cost of information. And let me explain what I mean by that, by measuring information by its value. So consider this example. Suppose I've lost a book in my house. And my question is, where is my book? So somebody might give me the following answer. It's not, answer one is, it's not in the kitchen. The second answer is, it is in your room. It's a more informative answer, right? Because it tells you not only that it's not in the kitchen, but it is in your room. So it's more specific. And the third answer is, it is in your room under your bed. This is even more informative. Now, how can I uh, measure information? here. So I can say, why do I need the answer? I need the answer because I want to find my book. I want to save time searching for my book. So I can measure information by how much time each answer would save me. The third answer saves me more time. And so uh, I can measure the time that it takes for me to find a book using this answer. And I can use, uh, I can see how much time I have saved and I can use that time to measure the information content of this answer. So another example, suppose I'm a businessman and I want to invest my money. I want to buy stocks, for instance. So I go and ask somebody, uh, where, should I, where should I invest my money? And the, I might ask is an expert and the expert tells me something. So how much profit I would make with that answer can be used to define the value of information, that information for me. So this is a way of measuring information by its monetary value, right? How much profit it would give to me. This is also one way of measuring information. So by measuring information by its value or cost, we are interested in the utility associate that, that we can obtain once we know the answer to the, to, to the question or once we receive the information. So here is a quiz. Um, consider the following two questions. Does God exist? The answer can be either yes or no. Or do you want sugar in your coffee? Again, the answer can be either yes or no. 
which answer is more informative? We might think that um, the first question is more fundamental, so it's more important. So its answer is uh, more informative. But it's a subjective judgment, right? Somebody might be more interested in the second question, the answer to the second question. So here I want to discuss the answer that Claude Shannon gave to this question. So Claude Shannon was an engineer and a mathematician, and he was uh, thinking from an engineering perspective, from a communication cost perspective. So his answer was, um, they have the same amount of information, both questions. The answer to both questions have the same amount of information. Let me explain. So suppose you want to communicate um, the answer to these questions to somebody else, right? You want to send them the answer. So what you can do is you can take a piece of paper, you can write the answer yes or no on the paper, you can put it in an envelope, and send it. Um, so from the communication perspective, in both cases, you're either writing yes or no. So the communication cost of communicating both answers uh, are the same, is the same, because in both cases, you're either sending yes or no. The answer to each question has two possibilities yes or no answer, so you're just communicating the correct possibility, the correct answer, right, out of the two possibilities. So Shannon does not care about, he says that the meaning of the answer, the implications, it's irrelevant to the, to the engineering problem of communicating the answer. If you're only interested in communicating the answer, the engineering part, it's not important what are the implications of different answers. It's just the number of different, how many answers are possible? Yes or no, two possibilities. That's all that is important from the communication perspective. So here is the paper that Shannon wrote. It's a very important paper. It laid the foundation of uh, modern communication systems that we're using, like your cell phone. And so the title of the paper is A Mathematical Theory of Communication. And here Shannon argues that the number of possible answers is what is important to measure in order to measure information from a communication cost perspective. So let me try to explain that. Um, let us go back to our example. You have lost your book in your house. And uh, I have some information about the location of the book, but I'm, I just want to, I just, I cannot talk to you. I'm only able to send you a text message via my cell phone about the location of the book. So here are the possible text messages that I can send. One message is, it is in the kitchen. It depends where the book is, but it can be, I, I, my answer, my text message could be, it is in the kitchen. It is not in the kitchen. I know it. So that could be my information. My text message could be, it is in your room or it is in your room under your bed or something else, right? So let us list all of these possible text messages. How many text messages are possible? How many messages are possible? Well, I don't know, but let's say 10,000 messages are possible about the location of uh, the book. So if I want to communicate my answer, um, what I can do is I can send you the number of the message. So for instance, if I want to tell you that it is in the kitchen, I can just send you number one, right? I can text you number one and you can look at, oh, what was message number one? It is in the kitchen. So you can go and search in the kitchen. Or I can send you a text message number 
10, right? This is something else. So text message number four. It is, if I send you four, you can, uh, it means that it is in your room under your bed, right? So I just need to send you a number between one to 10,000 because 10,000 is the number of possibilities, number of possible text messages. So the communication cost is sending a number between one to 10,000. So from um, Shannon's perspective, from a communication perspective, how much information I'm sending is more about the number of possibilities. It's more about what you can say than what you do say, right? Um, it's that 10,000 10, is uh, the important um, number here, right? Because you're sending a number out of 10,000 possible answers. You, one answer out of 10,000 possible answers. And uh, so this is uh, Shannon's idea. So if you have a quote, if you ask a question and there are M possible answers, then uh, if M is small, we say that the amount of information in the answer or message is small. So for instance, do you want sugar in your coffee? There are only two possibilities, yes or no, zero or one. So communicating it is easier. We say that the amount of information uh, in the uh, answer is small. But if the question has many different possible answers, then the amount of information in the message or answer is large. For instance, consider this question. Which country did you recently travel to? So the number of countries is about 200. So um, there are 200 possible answers and I have to send you a number between one to 200. So the communication cost would be higher because now I have to write, send you a number between one to 200. So the, because, the because Shannon measures information by the communication, by the cost of its communication. So here the answer has more information because it's harder to communicate, right? Because I have to send you a, a one country out of 200 possibilities. Okay, so um, here is a quote from Shannon. Let me just read it. The fundamental problem of communication is that of reproducing at one point, either exactly or approximately a message selected at another point. So I have a message, I want to send it to you. Uh, and uh, the problem of communication is that I have to tell you what I know, right? Frequently, the messages have meaning. That is, they refer to or are correlated to some system with certain physical or contextual entities. So the answer can have meaning. If I want to communicate to you, does God exist? Yes or no? I mean, this yes has some meaning, right? But Shannon says that these semantics semantic aspects of communication are irrelevant to the engineering problem, right? It doesn't matter what the answer means. The semantic aspect is not irrelevant. The significant aspect is that the actual message is one selected from a possible, from a set of possible messages. It's all, it's all that is important from a, an engineering perspective is how many different answers are possible to this question. That's, uh, that's important from a communication perspective. Okay, let me pause here and uh, answer any questions that you might have before I go to the second part of the talk. Thank you. I mean, information in a flower, right? Is it related to a question? Um, not necessarily, but um, you can always ask, you can always ask a question whose answer is, 
what you have, right? For instance, you could, hear, you could say, which flower did I smell? And then that specifies the, what you have observed, your observation. So no, but this is the way I try to present it in terms of questions and answers, but that is not necessary, necessarily the way to think about information. That's correct. But it's easier to think about questions, as, uh, information as answers to some question. But no, uh, the answer is no. It's something, I, and, and a source of information is, we, we think of it as something that can have different possibilities, right? It can um, be this flower, that flower, different. So that, that's all we uh, need. I hope the answer is clear. I think there are more questions. I mean, this is not related to what I want to discuss, but I, um, yeah, so it's not related, but I would think there are more questions than answers or more answers than questions. <laughs> so the problem is that, see, in uh, I'm trying to present this stuff in a very preliminary manner, right? You don't have the, the background you need to really, I, I, you need to know some b basics of probability to be able to define everything precisely. So I think the confusion is due to the fact that I'm using some language that is not necessarily precise, but I hope I'm able to communicate the basic ideas here. But I don't want you to be fixated on why I'm using answers to questions. You know, There is a theory behind this that does not treat the matter like this. Okay, so let us continue. So in the second part of my talk, I would like to discuss in further details, Shannon's approach for measuring information. So let us recap. Suppose you ask a question and get an answer. How much information is in the answer? So let M be the number of possible answers to the question. So for instance, assume that the question is, is there going to be an earthquake of magnitude seven today? So this is very highly unlikely. So let's say probability that the answer is no is very high. It's 0 0.9999999. And probably the answer is yes is extremely low, 0 0.0000001. So even though there are two possible answers, yes and no to this question, but the answer yes almost never occurs. So approximately it does not exist. Effectively it does not exist. And there is only one possible answer here. And when you hear that no earthquake has occurred, you wouldn't be surprised. Uh, so it's not fair to say that this um, question has two possible answers because one answer is so unlikely that almost we can say that it does not exist. So for this reason, at the beginning, I will restrict myself to questions where all the answers are equally likely. I will get to the cases where different answers have different probabilities later in the talk, but at the beginning for simplicity, let us assume that all the answers are equally likely. So for instance, if I'm just considering questions where if there are two possible answers, yes and no, they occur with prob equal probability one half each. Or the question could be, what is the outcome of throwing a fair die? We know that a fair die, in a fair die, uh, all the faces have equal probability one over six. So this is the class of questions that uh, I will consider first. And then I will uh, discuss the cases where different answers have different uh, probabilities. So 
Shannon's measure of information is called entropy. And in the case of uh, equally likely answers, uh, Shannon's measure of information or entropy is equal to logarithm of the number of possible answers m in base two. Uh, now, what is the meaning of Shannon's entropy? Um, the meaning is how many binary digits or bits, zero ones, are needed to store the answer. So as you might know, uh, you probably know, everything on your hard drive, in the hard drive of your computer, uh, is stored as a string of zeros and ones. So all the files have a size in terms of uh, bytes or bits, how many zeros, ones are there in the file. Everything is measured by bits. Um, now, the first step here is to first convert the answer um, into a string of bits and then store or communicate that. There are some very good reasons why we want to convert everything into bits. I don't want to get there. But let's assume we, that's what we want to do. And uh, we want to see why this uh, logarithm of m in base 2 shows up when we want to represent the answer in bits. OK. So suppose that um, m is 2, you have two possible answers. Let's say yes or no. I can represent yes with one and no with zero. So I'm coding the answer into one bit here. Now, if you have a question with four possible answers, A, B, C, D, then you can code it, uh, represent the answer with two bits. You can code the answer into two bits. So A would be one, one, say, E would be one zero, C would be zero one, D would be zero zero. And uh, now if M is three, you have three possible answers. You can still code it in two bits, but you cannot do it with one bit because one bit gives you only two possibilities. So if M is two, you need one bit. If M is four, you need two bits. If M is eight, you can do it with three bits because three bits gives you eight possibilities. And uh, in general, the number of bits you need is the ceiling of logarithm of M in base two. This is the number of bits you need to store your answer. Um, there's a ceiling here. Shannon's entropy did not have a ceiling, but I will get into that later. Um, but I hope you can see why this ceiling of logarithm of m in base 2 is the number of bits we need, uh, we need in order to store the answer. Uh, now, this ceiling of logarithm of m in base 2 halt also has an interpretation as a guessing interpretation. Interpretation in the number of binary questions, yes and no questions, we need to ask in order to learn the correct answer. So let me explain. Suppose the correct answer is either A or B, it has two possibilities, and uh, I want to figure out which, whether it's A or B. If I just ask the question, is the answer A? Uh, if yes, I, know, I will know that it's A, otherwise I will know it's B. Now, if answer has three possibilities, A, B, C, I can ask, I need to ask two questions at least. I cannot do it with one. I can ask two binary questions. I can first ask, is the answer in A, B? Uh, if no, I will not learn that it's C. If yes, I have to ask the second question, is the answer A? Now, if the answer is in a set of size eight, one of these eight possibilities, I need to ask three questions three yes or no questions. 
how, uh, for instance, I can first ask whether the answer is in A, B, C, D, right? Um, if yes, I will then split this into half and ask whether the answer is in the first part A, B or no. And then based on the answer that I get, I can ask my third question. Um, so three questions suffices. And the number of questions I need to ask is this floor, is the ceiling of logarithm of M in base two. And there is a famous 20 questions game that I'm pretty sure you have played before. So the game is as follows. The first player chooses a word. The second player wants to ask and wants to guess the word. The second player is allowed to ask up to 20 yes or no questions to determine uh, what is the word. Now the Oxford Dictionary has these many words and Webster's uh, Dictionary um, has these many words. And if you compute the logarithm of these numbers and take this ceiling, you get 18 or 19. So with 20 questions, it's a fair game. Um, you should be able to figure out the correct, the chosen word if you ask good questions. So Shannon's entropy, uh, as I said, it's a logarithm of M in base two, not with the ceiling. So for M uh, three, it would be logarithm of three in base two, 1.58. Etc. And so, what is the meaning of uh, logarithm of m in base two without the ceiling? Because Shannon, uh, Shannon's entropy does not have the ceiling. So, in order to understand that, we need to consider the concept of block representations, which I will explain in the next slide. So let me explain the idea of block representation. In many practical settings, uh, we are not getting just one question or one answer, but a sequence of questions and answers. So here are some examples. So suppose instead of just having one person and asking him whether he wants sugar in his coffee, we might have a group of people and uh, ask each person in the group whether he wants sugar in his coffee. Then we get a sequence of answers. Uh, we can also think of a text as a sequence of letters coming one after the other, right? So if you're given a text, um, we can think of the text as a sequence of letters, not just one letter. And if we want to store the text, we are basically storing a sequence of letters, not just one letter. Or uh, even when we think of an image, um, we can, an image con we can think of it as uh, an image consisting of a sequence of pixels, right? So, um, the idea of block representation is to assume that you're not given just one, an one answer to one question, but a sequence of answers or outputs. And you want to represent them together. You want to store them together. You want to communicate them together. So let us see how this, uh, uh, what happens when we do this. Um, So consider a question with three possible answers. Let's say M is three and uh, your answers have three possibilities, A, B, C. If you have two questions and you get two answers, there are nine possibilities for the answer, three times three. Here are the possibilities, nine possibilities of the answers. For instance, the first question you might get answer A, the second question A or A, B or A, C. And if you ask N questions, there will be three to the N possibilities for the answers to these N independent questions. 
Now, what is the number of bits you need to store the answer to these n questions? That would be a logarithm of uh, 3 to the n, right? Because 3 to the n is the number of possibilities. And uh, we take this logarithm and we take its ceiling. And this is equal to n times um, logarithm of 3 in base 2. This is the number of bits you need uh, to have if you want to uh, store n uh, answers together. So how much bit we are spending per question? It's this ceiling of n log 3 divided by n. This is the number of bits we are spending per question. And uh, it's an easy calculation. If you take the limit as n goes to infinity of this ratio, the limit would be the logarithm of 3 in base 2. And the reason is simple. The ceiling of n log 3 in base 2 is, is greater than or equal to n times log 3 and less than or equal to 1 plus n times log 3. So if you divide both si all sides by n and take the limit, you will see that as n goes to infinity, the number of bits that you need to spend per question uh, converges to this log 3 in base 2. Now, this is the interpretation of Shannon's entropy without this ceiling. It equals the minimum number of bits you need to store or represent a block of messages or a block of uh, answers. Here are some examples. So suppose you have a fair coin answers, you're getting a fair coin, there are two possibilities. Um, so log of two is one, so it's one bit of information. If you uh, get the answer, whether it was head or tails, you're, you, have got, you have received one bit of information. A fair toss, there are six possibilities, so it's log of six. Now, if you're given a random real number in the interval zero, one, how much information have you received? So there are infinitely many numbers, right, in the interval zero to one. So it's, you have received infinite bits of information, right? So if you are, if you get um, a number in zero, one, and uh, you look at its expansion in base two, so you're getting, you're receiving infinite bits uh, in the expansion, right? So it's infinite bits of information. If you have an image of size 64 times 64, um, so it has 64 times 64 pixels, each pixel um, has a red component, green component, blue component. Let's say we have a resolution of 256. So for each pixel, I will have 256 times 256 times 256 possibilities uh, for, uh, the, um, for the red, green, blue components. And there are 64 times 64 pixels. So I'm considering all possible images, right? Where each pixel can have any color. Now in realistic images, that's not the case. Like if one pixel has a certain color, pixels adjacent to it have similar colors. But here I'm just considering uh, uh, all possible images. Now, if from the set of all possible images, you're given one particular image, how much information you have given the logarithm of this number in base two, which would be nine, um, uh, this number, right? 98,000 uh, bits approximately. Okay, so let me pause here. I have told you uh, Shannon's entropy for the case where all the answers are equally likely. Next, I will discuss the case where 
different answers have different probabilities. But it would be, this is a good time to stop and see if there are any questions. Thank you. The order of answers, uh, yeah, so you want to know the answer for each person, right? So you, when you want to store it, you want to know that the answer to the first person was yes or no, the answer to the second person was yes or no. You, you, the order is important because you want to store the entire information. You want to represent the entire information. You don't want to lose anything. That's a good question. Uh, um, I mean, in, we are as, in that context, so I was assuming that uh, both parties already know what question is being asked and what answer is being given. If you don't know that, then um, the number of your interpretation, the number of possibilities, everything changes. Yeah, so the amount of information changes. Um, if you're just given some word, you don't know what it is, then it would be a word in the dictionary, right? So, but if you're you're asked uh, which city, you, you know that it's a, the answer to the question, which city did you travel to? The number of possibilities would be smaller. You expect to hear the name of a city. So the amount of information you get is different. So the context is important. That's correct. Yeah, so that the entire like information theory is how to represent optimally represent information and communicate information. So, um, so this is what uh, I'm just giving you a little bit of what what's happening in the theory. Yes, there 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 are some open questions. Of course, there's certain things that we do not know. There are some problems we do not we cannot solve, but there's a lot that we know. This is an introduction to this topic. Yeah, we aim to find the optimal uh, ways to store information, convey information. That's a very good question. Very, very good question. It is true. When you hear yes, you will get learn a lot of information, but because probability that you hear yes is so low, you have to multiply that probability by the, your surprise, right? You would be very surprised if you hear the answer yes, you will learn a lot, but you will hear it so rarely that you need to multiply these two. So this term P log P is exactly that. You multiply the probability by your surprise. So, so it's a, so there's also a meaning, an interpretation of this formula for entropy uh, in terms of uh, how much you would be surprised if you hear the answer. So log of, one over, log of one over P or minus log P, minus log P is the amount of your surprise if you hear the answer. And then you have to multiply it by the probability that you will be surprised. And this gives you a small number. So. So let me answer the second question first. Um, so I did not prove that inequality. Why, when you divide an object into two parts, uh, some of their entropies is larger than entropy of the whole thing, but I can give you an intuition. So what was the meaning of entropy? And meaning of entropy was the number of bits you need to store the object, right? Either one uh, answer from, or multiple answers, right? One instance or multiple instances, okay? So that was the meaning of entropy. Now, if you divide an image, an object into two parts, you can store them individually, right? You can store the first part and store the second part. That would al always give you a way to store the whole thing, right? So some of the entropies of the two parts is a way for you to store the full thing. Right, so if there's some of their entropies should be larger than entropy of the full thing, because that is one particular strategy for storing. But if you're storing the whole thing together, maybe there are more efficient way of storing it. So that, that's, that, that's the reason you, you have the inequality. 
because this you, you might have more efficient way of storing the whole thing, the two parts together than storing them separately. Uh, entropy of the image, uh, it depends. I mean, if you're looking at uh, random images, I, I had a slide where uh, I gave you a number, some 98,000 something. If you're looking at images of humans or images of faces or something like that, then the entropy would be much smaller because you're restricting the number of possibilities. Um, I am not aware of estimates of entropy, but maybe you can find it on the internet, some estimates. It, I, I'm not sure anybody knows exactly how many possible faces you might have in the world. I mean, how many images of, these are difficult questions. But um, it's definitely much smaller than the number I reported, uh, 98,000 something, right? So. On your computer, you can store an image in JPEG format, bitmap format, different formats, right? So this is called compression. Sometimes you, so there are different ways to store information, different algorithms. Uh, sometimes you don't want to store the entire information. I mean, when you store something in JPEG, you see that you lose some information. When you zoom in, you, you have lost your information or we have compression algorithms. This is a huge topic. I mean, if you're interested, uh, you can uh, read more about them. My purpose in this talk was exactly ma make you excited and interested in this topic, right? So it's a big topic. The methods are, diverse you know it's you can go and read about them um yeah so i mean i don't have much to say specifically there is um yeah so maybe i leave it to you to follow up on this yourself yes i mean if it has one possibility then its entropy is zero because log of one is zero, right? So if you, for instance, if you know the answer to a question, already you know the answer. When you hear the question, the answer again, you don't learn anything new. So its entropy is zero because if you already know the answer, it will have one possibility from your perspective, right? So it's just one possibility, log of one is zero. Entropy being zero means that there's no information. You already know it. So here is another uh, application for the inequalities on entropy that I mentioned. Suppose you have n points in R3 that have nx distinct projections on the yz plane. So if you project the points on the yz plane, some of two points might have, might have the same projection. We count the number of distinct projections on the yz plane and call this nx. nx is projection along the x-axis. ny, distinct projections on the xz plane, and nz, distinct projections on the xy plane. Then the claiming is that n squared is less than nx times ny times nz. So here is an example. Suppose these are your endpoints, 0, 0, 001, 0, 0, 002, 0, 00, n. These are the coordinates of the endpoints. If you project along the z axis, the projection of this point 0, 0, 001 would be just 0, 0. Projection of 0, 0, 002 would also be 0, 0. And the last point is projection along the z axis to the xy plane would be also 0, 0. So there is just one distinct projection. So NZ is one. But if you project this along the Y or X axis, you get N distinct points. So in this case, NX and Y are both equal to N and NZ equals equal to one. So NX times NY times NZ would be N squared. And this inequality holds with equality in that case. I'm not going to prove this inequality for you, but it's very similar to the example that we, I just uh, showed, uh, I just proved for you, but I'm, I'm going to skip the proof, but you can think about this yourself. 
Okay, so uh, I now want to discuss the last part of the talk, which is communicating information. So, so far we have discussed about the meaning of information and measuring information uh, via Shannon's approach, which is how many bits you need to store or compress um, blocks of uh, repetitions of sequences of answers uh, from the uh, source, right? So that the amount of bits you need to store on average was our definition of Shannon's uh, entropy or Shannon's notion of um, information. Now, we have suppose we have converted um, uh, our information into bits. We have uh, stored it on a hard drive. And now the next task is to communicate it, communicate it and send it over to somebody else. That's also an important uh, engineering problem. So broadly speaking, uh, a communication system has three components. The first one is a sender or transmitter. It can be a person or a device. So for instance, if you want to send a text message to your friend, you are the transmitter and the, your mobile phone is your device. Or if you are talking to somebody else, uh, you, are the if you are the speaker, you are the transmitter or you are the sender. There's also a receiving end, a receiver. And uh, between the transmitter and receiver, we have a medium through which information travels. So as an example, transmitter can be a speaker who produces sound waves in the air. Receiver can be a person in the audience. And medium is the air from the mouth of the speaker to the ears of the audience. So you can see that I have added a noise here to the medium. I want to emphasize that uh, there is always corruption and distortion when information flows through the medium. So there's a distance between the transmitter, the sender and the receiver and sound waves get corrupted as they travel through the air. There might be also other people talking and that also is, that's also part of the noise of the medium. So as an example, here is uh, a text that has been corrupted while it's been transmitted. If you are able to read this text, it means that you are able to denoise. You are able to remove noise from that has been added to this text, remove the corruption. So I wait for a few seconds for you to be able to do it, for you to read this. So it says only information essential to understanding must be transmitted. This is the text. So I hope you are able to read this. So communicating information is a very broad area and various different problems can be defined involving inform transmission of information. Um, I have tried to give you a glimpse of different problems that are studied in the literature by giving you a list of puzzles. So uh, these puzzles involve information, transmission of information or utilizing information in different ways. And uh, I invite you to try to solve these problems if you have not already. Uh, here in the remaining part of my talk, I um, will solve the first puzzle for you. And uh, that would be the end of the talk. So. Here is the puzzle. We have a deck of N cards. Number I is written on the ith card for I from one to N. So the, on the first card, we have written one, second card, two, third card, three. The cards have numbers. There are two people, A and B, collaborating. The game is as follows. Person C randomly selects K cards from the deck and gives them to person B. 
So there's a person C selects K cards at random and gives them to person B. Now person B reveals the numbers on K minus one cards to person A in a sequence. That is, it reveals the numbers written on K minus one cards one by one. So this is the number on the first card, second card, third card. So he reveals the numbers on K minus one cards. Now player A has to infer or figure out the number on the remaining card, right? With the last card, the case card was not revealed to person A, but person A has to figure it out. No other communication of any sort is allowed between person A and person B except for an initial strategy session before the game starts and before the K cards are handed to person B. So person A and person B can have a discussion session um, where they try to devise some strategy for person B so that uh, person A is able to guess the remaining card. And the question is how large can the deck N be? in terms of k for this to be possible. For instance, if n is k, if there are a, n is a k and uh, then the problem is trivial, right? So if the identity of k minus one cards are revealed, you know that, well, the remaining card is just the last card. I mean, you, it's trivial. The problem is trivial in this case. But how large can n be for the person um, a be able to guess? correctly guess uh, or infer the remaining card. Now sh show that the largest possible n is k factorial plus k minus one. And uh, which means that when n is k factorial plus k minus one, uh, you need to give a strategy. You need to give uh, an algorithm for um, person B and person A so that person A can recover the unknown, uh, the, the last card. And show that if N is larger than K factorial plus K minus one, this is not possible. There is no strategy for person A to always correctly guess the number on the remaining card. So remember person C is giving the K cards to person B. So person A and person B do not know the identity of the cards in advance. Um, so where is information in this puzzle? Person B, uh, person A has to figure out the case card. So some information has to be transmitted from person B to person A. Person B knows the identity of the remaining card, person A does not. So somehow uh, this information has to be revealed, has to be transferred to person A. So there is a communication of information. So what is person B doing here? He's revealing cards one by one, right? K minus one cards. Um, so after a person B has chosen his K minus one cards, um, he has, there are K minus one factorial permutations of these K minus one cards. And by choosing a permutation, he is, can uh, signal some information. He can send some information to person A. Um, so, but the, the actions of, um, I just want to see what, how many actions, uh, different actions person B has. So he has K minus one factorial permutations. There are also uh, K possibilities for which card to hold up and which K minus one cards to show, right? So from the perspective of person B, the number of different actions, different possible actions that he has is at most K times K minus one factorial or K factorial choices. So person B has at most K factorial choices to make. 
Therefore, the amount of information that person B can communicate to person A is at most the log of K factorial, right? This many bits at most person B can send to person A. Now, how much information person A needs to recover to infer the remaining card? So K minus one cards have been revealed. N minus K minus one card remain. And he needs at least log of this number because it, the remaining card can be any of these uh, n minus k minus one card. So log of n minus k minus one should be less than or equal to log of k factorial. This is an intuitive argument. I will next give you a formal argument, but I just want to show you that um, how information transfer is happening, right? At most, uh, log of k factorial bits can be communicated from person B to person A, no more than that. So here is a formal argument. Um, so we first argue that uh, um, k factorial has to be larger than n minus k plus one. Okay, so this we first show that this is necessary, and then in the next part, I will give you a strategy for uh, person A and person B to for person A to be able to infer. But for here now, at the beginning, I want to prove to you that this inequality is necessary and cannot be more than k factorial plus k minus one. So here is how the argument goes. Uh, there are at most n times n minus one to n minus k plus two sequences of length k minus one that person B can show to person A. Why? Because the first card that person B is showing has at most n possibilities. And once that card is revealed, the second card has at most n minus one possibilities. And the k minus one card has at most n minus k plus two possibilities. So the number of ordered sequences of cards k, of length k minus one that you can see, person A can see is at most this, this, these many sequences. Now, for each of these sequences that person B reveals to person A, person A should be able to recover, infer the kth card. So each of these must have a unique last card, right? So therefore this number should be at least as big as n choose k. Why? Because n choose k is the number of ways to choose k cards, right? Then so person C is giving person B k cards. So this is the number of ways that person C is giving a card to person um, B. And these are different, uh, the number of sequences that uh, person A can see, can, can see. And person A is, should be able to recover the K cards that are chosen, right? So the number of, uh, and because person A is able to get the K cards, figure out the K cards, uh, the number of possible sequences that are shown to him, which is N times N minus one times N minus K plus two, should be at least larger than the number of ways that uh, K cards can be chosen. This implies that k factorial is larger than n minus k plus one. So n is at most k factorial minus k uh, uh, plus k minus one. So for uh, the case where n is exactly k factorial plus k minus one, we need to give an argument that there is a strategy for um, to do this, right? So we make a bipartite graph here. Uh, the nodes on the left-hand side are ordered sequences of length k minus one. So a sequence of 
each item in the sequence is a number between one to n. And uh, we take a sequence of length k minus one, it's an ordered sequence. Um, and we put a vertex for each sequence. For instance, it could be uh, vertex uh, number one, three, four, anything, a sequence, an ordered sequence of length k minus one. So this is uh, vertices on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we put sets. So this, these are not ordered. We put sets of size k. Okay, how many sets of size k we have? We have n choose k. So there are n choose k nodes on the right-hand side. And we connect a sequence on the left-hand side to a node on the right-hand side. If these k minus elements that are uh, in the node here are included in the set. Okay, so if, if the set on the right-hand side contains the k minus one uh, uh, numbers of the sequence, we put an edge between them. So this is the construction of the bipartite graph. Now, um, a sequence of length k minus one is shown to uh, Alice, to, to person A, right? And person A is able to recover uh, the set of size k, right? That's the chosen set of size k. So, um, the strategy of um, Alice, the, the, the strategy of person A, is to find a set of size k that is connected to the sequence of length k minus one that it is observing. So, person A observes the sequence of length k minus one. It has to produce in, in for the last card. So it has to produce a set of size k, okay? And uh, so there, it, it, it's, it's as if uh, person A is finding uh, a vertex here that is connected to the observed node on the left-hand side. This is the strategy of, um, um, the strategy of person A, okay? All right. What is the strategy of person B? Person B observes a set of size k and it has to output a sequence of length k minus one. So the strategy of person B is to select a vertex on the left-hand side that is connected to the observed node, to the observed set. Okay, so person B starts with a set of size k and then from the sequences of length k minus one that are connected to that node, he chooses one of them and reveals to person A. Person A has to go the other way, has to go from sequences of length k minus one to sets of to a set of size k. Now let us find the degrees of uh, nodes in this graph. So if you have a node on the left-hand side, um, it is connected to n minus k plus one nodes on the right hand. So the degrees of nodes on the left hand side is n minus k plus one. Why? Because k minus one elements are fixed and one more element is needed to make a set of size k. And that element has n minus k plus one possibilities. On the right hand side, the degrees are is k factorial. Why? Because you, if you're given a set of size k and you want to take k minus one elements and order them um, to form a sequence of k minus one, there, there are k factorial ways to do this. So if you consider any permutation of the numbers in the set of size k, you can take some permutation and re consider the first k minus one elements. So there are k factorial permutations of a set of k numbers. So the degree uh, of nodes on the right-hand side is k factorial. Note that when n is equal to k factorial plus k minus one, the two degrees are the same. Now, <clears throat> there's a theorem 
called Hall's theorem that um, gives a condition for existence of a perfect matching um, in this graph, right? The perfect matching is uh, you choose a set of edges such that uh, each edge on uh, the left-hand side is connected exactly to one edge on the right-hand side. Now, if you have a perfect matching, then the strategy of person A is clear. Once he observes the sequence of length A, he can look in the matching, which node on the right-hand side it is connected to, and then he can report it. So let me conclude my talk. First, I discuss Shannon's notion of information, which was based on the communication cost of information. Uh, I derived Shannon's entropy as uh, minus P1 log P1, minus P2 log P2, et cetera, um, where P1 to PM were probabilities of different uh, answers, possible answers. M is the number of possible answers and PIs are the probability of uh, seeing different answers. Uh, I also uh, gave you uh, some applications of entropy. And uh, finally, I briefly discussed the problem of communicating information. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Also, I would like to thank uh, Chandra Nair, Eifer Osgur, Jan Konkin, and Sachi Wiseman uh, for sharing ideas, course materials, puzzles, etc. So I uh, would like to thank all of them. And uh, finally, I would like to thank you, uh, the audience, for listening to my talk. Thank you. Yeah, so it's interesting. The entropy formula for quantum states, like this formula, summation p log one minus p, it was found even before Shannon in the context of, by von Neumann, in the context of quantum, uh, I think quantum mechanics or something like that. So this formula predates Shannon, but not, Sh Shannon had a particular way of thinking about the problem. Also, the entropy itself you know in uh, statistical physics we have entropy and there are some connections between uh, Shannon's entropy and entropy in statistical physics so qubits yeah we, they we have a quantum information theory they try to generalize everything that Shannon did to quantum systems um, and uh, yeah so it's certainly true that uh, once we can do computations over, once we build quantum computers, uh, maybe in 10 years, 20 years, I don't know. I don't have any estimate, but that, that would be revolutionized, revolutionized the, the way we compute and everything. Yeah, so it's, it's true, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I dropped them for simplicity. Actually, the base is not important because it's just a multiplicative factor. You can use base three, base E. Um, we use base two because we want to represent it as bits, but some people also use base E. It doesn't matter. I mean, all the logarithms ha should have base two or they should all have the same base. It's just a multiplicative factor, right? So they all, your answer would, differ by some constant if you change the base it's not fundamental it's like you're measuring length in meters or in feet or in inches you know it's all the same thing you can convert one to the other base is like that it's the unit yeah yes therefore continuous cases uh, there are also similar notions of entropy in the continuous case. 
um, information. Everything is has a generalization for the con, for the inf case of like functions where the number of possibilities is infinite. Yeah, it has also a theory, but I have not discussed it here. The answer is yes, but you, you have to read it in the textbooks. Yeah. So the entropy in that sense is infinity, right? If you, the number of possibilities is infinity, the, the answer would be infinity. But we have different types of infinity, right? When you, once you stop, compare them, um, things become meaningful. So there is a theory for that. Uh, usually people try to quantize uh, a continuous space, like, um, discretize it and then work with the discrete stuff and then go back to continuous stuff. So there is, yeah, I mean, I cannot explain it here because I don't have the required background. But there are, there, the answer is yes, there is, there is a literature. There, there, there's some stuff there, but you need some background. That's, that was the main difficulty for me. You need to first learn a probability and then information theory course is usually a graduate course. Um, so these puzzles were carefully selected because uh, each of them relate to a particular, even maybe research domain within information theory. So, um, I mean, I have not just put a number of puzzles together. They, they, there is some intention behind them. Um, I. So I asked different researchers, right? I contacted, you saw the, their names. I contacted some people, oh, how should I, do you know of any puzzles? How should I tell this? And they, they gave me their ideas. I don't know uh, like a, so research, a book or, I mean, uh, somewhere where you can go and try it and find similar puzzles. I'm sorry, I mean, this, these are, I just asked people and thought myself what, what would be good. There's no, I don't know of any collection anywhere where they can look at. Maybe there is, I don't know. But I mean, if you're interested, if they're interested in uh, uh, the particular problems, like the two combinatorial problems, the number of edges, triangles, or the that projection problem, we had endpoints and you project it. If, if, if students search information theory and combinatorics, there are some courses and even like list of problems where you can use information theory in combinatorics. There are a lot of tools and you, you can find courses specifically on information theory and combinatorics. Yes, uh, Shannon also has a paper uh, on uh, cryptography and um, we have like in cryptography, we have physical layer cryptography and uh, like computational cryptography. So there's a bunch of a, a group of information theorists working on information theory, this security. Yes, there is absolutely, absolutely. You can see there's information, right? So when, when, whenever you have information, security, privacy, all these terms, uh, all of these are would be relevant. Yeah, so, but, it's a very technical topic, right? Um, so if you look at information theory textbooks, you can find chapters on security. 